universities' funding should get pulled if they don't ensure that all researchers meet the minimum transparency standard. Okay, welcome back to the Saving Science video series. In this final installment, uh, we will go over some new delicious tools uh, in development for how to make your science more user-friendly, more accessible in the context of rising transparency standards. Uh, but a brief recap from the previous video where we covered more general tools, new tools to be more transparent in your research and new standards for both transparency and replication. And so we'll go back to this diagram. And so we reviewed, for example, the various places you can pre-register studies, the various places you can post your study materials, post your data, post your code, uh, ensure you're meeting proper reporting guidelines, which were inspired by early work. And then the basic three, what we're calling basic three, which is disclosing funding sources, funding conflicts of interest or competing interest, and author contributions. And then, of course, the open access which is fundamentally the most important, though this should be should have been solved decades ago. Um, various open access platforms, preprint servers, where you can freely post a working paper and get feedback from anyone in the broader community. Um, and And so this is very exciting. And then we reviewed kind of the an integrated system to bring all this together, both in terms of transparency and tracking credibility, which as a reminder involves reproducing analyses to make sure you can get the same results with respect to uh, reproduction or result reproducibility. Uh, then you can just link critical commentaries, whether those are coming from PubBeer or other platforms, uh, or link to a preprint of a commentary of an article, and then replications where you actually repeat using the same study materials methodology the study in a new sample of participants, and then you can track and organize the replicability of effects reported in a paper. And also result robustness, which is repeating different statistical analyses that are also justifiable, making sure the results are robust to alternative justifiable um, statistical analyses. <clears throat> And but before jumping into the cured science demo, I want to demonstrate the status quo, meaning the current system of interfacing with science, which means finding PDFs and then interacting with the scientific article, consuming scholarly content and and this is i'm literally just going to the tools it's not scripted i should have maybe and so i'm not going to be cherry picking and weird examples to make the current 
system look worse than it is. Um, and again, you can prove me wrong if uh, I am deluding myself. And so let's go here. Uh, this is another graph I might get into uh, or not. And so typically you can either use Google to search for scientific articles, um, but Google will generally point you away from scientific articles because they're less popular and their algorithm page rank system is based more on popularity and credibility of the web pages which means who's linking to your web page so unless you're typing in a specific title or unless you know about google scholar then you would actually be unlikely to even find scientific papers though i think there's there's improvements now with these other platforms um like researchgate and meta.org semantic scholar academia.edu that are helping in some ways uh, though we'll see they have many problems to helping academics disseminate their research so it reaches a broader audience um and so you could let's say you have a condition like anxiety you could type treatment for anxiety and and what you get is uh, medicalnewstoday.com you get a uk looks like a uk government website that's good webmd.com which is seems okay but definitely not peer reviewed and now we have a US government and cbi.gov which is pretty credible though their website is designed from the 80s I think um, so this is a good example right there is hope because as you saw Right, I'm within the first five top hits, and I've managed to get to an open access, publicly funded article on treatments for anxiety. Because maybe I suffer from anxiety. I want some help. I want to reduce my symptoms so I can enjoy my life better. And, and this one too. Let's see this unscripted oh we got some kung flu warnings and okay we'll focus on the other one so this is a good example um so you can tell that the user interface user experience is a bit outdated but this is actually still uh, much better than in general um, and so we can also show this um, by actually showing a uh, actual academic journal which you think well you think those would be popping up right so i mean we need to keep going mayo clinic beyond blue helpguide.org you know i'm not seeing any um articles from academic journals showing up in right 
So their search engine optimization is not adjusted correctly, or they're maybe they're maybe they don't want their academic articles to appear in Google, which would be highly curious because that's the best and most popular way to find stuff online is using Google. Oh, here's APA.org, which is the largest professional society in psychology. Though they are highly questionable more recently about, we mentioned, blocking or being against legislation that would make all publicly funded research open access. They are against that. Hmm, wonder why. And they also support torture or supported torture. But let's not get into that. Um... Okay, so they have a PDF here, but again, do they link, like they're not even linking to an actual peer-reviewed article. This seems just, I mean, presumably this brochure is based on credible scientific evidence, but they don't even give you access to it. So this is another great example, right? But I'm going to try to... Oh, find an APA journal. I mean, I know the names of some, so we can just go straight there. Oh, journals, a journal of psychiatry. Here you go, by title, Behavioral Neuroscience. So, so these are official academic journals. And again, our website is pretty archaic, out of date. But <clears throat> so notice, okay, table of contents, pricing information. And so we can go view table of contents. And oh, we could go full screen, I guess. Wow, this is pretty ugly. And so they give you this is their most recent issue, I guess, February 2020. They give you the titles and the abstract, but no access. You click get access, $15. Or check access if you have the million dollar subscription yearly fee. So, and this is still mostly common. Or I guess we saw last time it was about 50% are of academic articles in the social sciences are block behind a paywall but this is disgusting this is mostly publicly funded research which you could verify if you had access to it <laughs> um, and again this would be even better if if you can find a psychiatry journal but Oh no, that was not what I they reviewed. Anyways, uh, you get the idea. I mean, if if you want to say, "Oh, I have anxiety. I want to uh, find." Here, treatments of anxiety. <laughs> See, 
<laughs> but you're saying, oh, I want to use scientific evidence. I don't want to just any random blog. I want real credible scientific evidence. I have serious anxiety, right? I don't want help from a guru. Well, good luck. But you don't even have access to it. Never mind trying to find, here you go, actual treatments. Impact of brief dynamic interpersonal theory on veteran depression and anxiety, right? So you could say, oh, that sounds promising. Maybe that could help me. Well, you got to pay up. Though you already paid as, so this is, uh, who knows, but uh, assuming this is, well, actually, so here's, assuming it's coming from a publicly funded university, the public's already paid for this research. And now they need to pay again to access it. So again, this will go down in history as one of the most epic criminal acts ever. And literally even, so I'm recording from home, and even I, as a research fellow at a prominent university, I could access this through a proxy server, that, but the, through the library, but then I have to have this plug in and do this and do that. And I, I don't even bother because I want to be reminded that this is what most people see when they interface with science. It's just these paywalls. And this is what I would do to try to get access. You go to first Google Scholar. You just copy and paste the title. And, you know, that wasn't too promising. Another thing you can try to do is Sci-Hub. But Sci-Hub is now blocked in certain countries, including Belgium. Or it just doesn't work for certain sites. So it only works with 97%, though that's pretty impressive. So, and I, when Sci-Hub used to work in Belgium, uh, it, it still didn't work for APA journals. So they've paid programmers to make sure that Sci-Hub doesn't work with their content. That's a dark achievement. So this is what I mean. You're just paywall, paywall, block, 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 private property, access only for the elite. And it's just disgustingly wrong because again, they are there are millions of people who probably every year could benefit either medical doctors in developing countries or just citizens trying to treat their condition, whether serious or even not serious. It's still public science, public scientific knowledge needs to remain in the public domain. It, there's just no counter argument and, and, Soon the legislation, the laws will be changed that if you block access to public science, you will face hefty fines, maybe even jail time. Um, but right here, I'll um, show another example. Uh, what am I doing? Go back here. So, but if you do find it, um, typically Google Scholar will show you links to the article. And then often there is multiple. So then you can click all five versions and then try to find the best because there's kind of a pecking order where oh this is a good example academia.edu they offer pdfs but they're often hard to find in terms of user experience or you have to log in so that's called a lock in model so it's it's well to to us not it's still not good enough i mean you want public 
access where it's accessible by just clicking on it like that so uh, but this is interesting they'll have they sometimes show it to you directly without logging in but then in a few days or weeks then the link stops working and then they force you to log in and again why like, other than the server cost being too expensive uh, again if you're organizing science or you're a platform they claim they're trying to open up science well it has to be open to the public without logging in without logging signing screens and because again you have to think people will be uh, all kinds of people are going to be trying to access this on their smartphone, on a poor internet connection. You don't want to have them to have to log in because, uh, you know, it, it has to be easily accessible in the fewest steps possible. Um, so, yeah, if you look at this link, there's secret stuff in the link where it, it's going to, there you go, expires. 3600 seconds or whatever it is and so that link won't work and so it's garbage no offense um but anyways let's find one <laughs> and then research gate is similar they give you access and then the link or so here's a good example. Now it, it's, it wants me to download. I don't want to download the PDF on my desktop. I want to consume it. Don't give me download. Or don't pretend that I'm going to see the PDF and then force me to download it. Um, so here's one of my own. I just want to see it. Of course, I'll show you this in curate science in a moment um so oh and this is this is also suboptimal so so i typed in the name of or part of the title it, it found it right away but the link it provides the primary link goes to the publisher's site because that's part of their agreement i think for crawling Oh, that's interesting. I think there's another one that will expire. See that it says token. Because if you... Huh. Anyways, this is not supposed to be open access. Anyways, unless they've retroactively... So, and, But again, you could go all 10 versions. And now, see, you can see my own website... Oh, I should remove it from ResearchGate. Uh, Semantic Scholar. And then, so therefore, you can find the ones that actually work. See, this is coming from my website, which is Google Cloud. So it's reliable, fast. Uh, Semantic Scholar is pretty good, but it sometimes brings you to a sub page, and then you got to scroll down, and then you have to click load. Um, PSU is a university. There's lots here, but this one you off if you do download too many papers per day, then it says exceeded and it blocks your access. So, anyways, it's a wild goose chase or a goose egg hunt. And and then even if it is accessible, as you saw here, uh, yeah, these are. PDFs, which are meant for print, you have static, it's a static page uh, with black and white figures, non-interactive tables, non-embeddable, not easily shareable. It's uh, the websites, the platforms are generally ugly, uh, no hyperlinks within the text. I mean, the list goes on and on. Um, and because again it's not just about 
publicly posting something. You want to make it inviting for people to consume uh, your research. And, and now there is a push for authors to create their own web page so I could type uh, uh, wolf and bamel. Usually you have your own website or you have a university website. And then it'll say website link from the university profile page. Or it just shows you the publication. And, and different universities have different systems. And this one is actually decent because um, it has some labels. It has some links. But you can see these really long author lists are pretty difficult uh, to read. Actually, if you click on the link, limo, it brings you somewhere else. Oh, dear. I didn't even know this. But this is a good example. I mean, so imagine you're the public and you're just, oh, I want to read this article. And now you're clicking and it's bringing you here. Like, where is, where is the article, right? I just want to read the article. So now you got to go, what? Request a copy. Available to K Leuven users. So that might work for me because I, you know, I have a university account, right? But meanwhile, the, the user, the government analyst, whomever is looking for this information, they've moved on. Let's see. Yeah, that's the same. Okay, well, see this is showing you it's it's a pretty honest depiction because I didn't script this and in some ways it's going worse, some some ways it's going better. But I thought there there are some ones that should go to the actual paper. Oh, okay. So now if you click the label, it forces you to download. Just strange. Uh, well, the other thing that's weird with their university or our university system is that you kind of get two profile pages. See, the first one there is the one we were just at. And then if you go to the second one, it's kind of a different web page or profile page. Yeah, and then you can click website and it goes to the other one. So that's also part of the broader system we'll, we'll get to in the demo is that this is integrated and it can be used by all research stakeholders and then for all universities or all journals. And, and we can start standardizing things so that, that you don't have like literally... 10,000 different universities reinventing the wheel in terms of how to organize researchers' publications, right? So here, I think you can click publication list. Then it brings you to another list. Oh, okay, so here's another list. This one's very slow. So this list has PDFs, icons, and links, which is good. I think these ones, yeah. So I think these ones go. OK, there you go. So these are the direct PDFs. And so this is nice, right? But again, PDFs, and this is color, pretty nice. Wow. Um, but it's still the old way of the past. We should have interactive articles. And this is where the cutting edge is. And then this link will link to a relevant link or the data. But again, this is, it's unclear to the user. It's just, where is this link 
going. Maybe it's a preprint, maybe it's data. And so as you'll soon see, yeah, so this is the OSF where you could find the study materials, ethics clearance, and maybe data over here. And yeah, and these should be external links so that you can stay on the, the list. But uh, so this is a typical, I didn't cherry pick this again. This is, is better than, than most actually. Um, yeah, so I should move on. I mean, I could give other examples but the overall theme here is that as we saw scientific content is mostly blocked inaccessible mostly unusable and ugly looking and terrible user interfaces and just a generally negative user experience is is the state of the current state of technology and but there are improvements in the direction of researchgate and academia.edu semantic scholar um yeah we can go back and demonstrate that and so as we're doing the demo and so i will go to cured science and wait 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 Oh yeah, and we'll start from the article card, which is again the. I need to change this. Is what organizing, which organizes the information at the article level. I guess we can full screen and maybe zoom in. And so in this case, I just pulled up a, a list of articles that are all related to large-scale replication efforts, but it doesn't matter for the demo. So this is the article card, which you, you've seen in, in the infographics, um, where we're just trying to lay out the information in the most intuitive and organized way possible some of it is inspired as you may have noticed from google scholar and how you have article title as being the largest field so that it catches your eye when you're scrolling uh, and then you have secondary fields like authors journal and then of course the transparency Badges, which are interactive. So when you hover, you, you see deeper information of, oh, okay, that's where that study is pre-registered. That's where the study materials are. That's where the data, code, and the reporting standards, which again, at minimum, we're talking the basic three. What are the funding sources, competing interests, author contributions? This is showing basic four, which again is basically the, the four categories of methodological details covered by the 21 word solution which is just affirming you've disclosed all excluded data conditions measures and sample size determination rule uh, and then of course if there are comments then uh, they can be linked so this is a large-scale replication here it shows you the title the sorry the article type uh, which is replications. It reports 16 replications of Finkel et al.'s 
2002 study one, uh, commitment on forgiveness effect. So that's telling you this article here is reporting 16 replications of a previous effect that was reported in 2002. And it's a registered report, which as we talked about, means the design was peer reviewed before the data collection and then pre-registered in a public registry and then it was carried out. And so now you can read the paper, which is linked here, uh, and confirm what? Oh, I think my computer is just being slow. And then confirm that the analyses we do report are indeed the analyses we specified we were going to do before the data collection. And, but there's more. Um, so this is kind of at a glance, the most important information that you'd want to see if, and, and this you can embed, you'll be able to embed this, uh, embed this card, sh share the card on social media, um, link to it in other article lists, collections of article cards, and even embed article lists. Um, but then you can expand the card to access secondary information, like the abstract text, keywords, and most interestingly, the, the figures. So you can interact directly with the figures um, and soon it'll be even more delicious. It'll be exposed even when the card is collapsed in the bottom right here. This is being implemented as we speak um, so that you can draw the reader in directly. And again, this makes it more accessible, not just more deliciously user-friendly, more accessible to anyone, even someone with a lower IQ that has maybe not that much experience with science because a picture uh, is worth a thousand words. And if you have, you, you, you'll even be able to have animated, um, graphs, animated GIFs. Uh, and then when you click on it, you can engage with it in full screen in this delicious fancy box media viewer, which is again, all touch enabled, looks beautiful on all device sizes, including tablet and small mobile screens. And so right now I'm, I'm actually interacting with the figure using my touch screen, pinch zoom. And so I can really zoom in to the details. And, you know, if this was, I'll try to, I can find a better example of a colored, these neuroscience brain images that are pretty colorful. Um, and then again, you can share, you can easily share this image directly to social media platforms uh, rather than having to link to a PDF and then go find it. Uh, you can link, share, and embed figures uh, on external sites, blogs, journalists. And this is swipe, so this is delicious. I can swipe, I can cancel out of it by dragging down or dragging up. And uh, Again, you want to make it inviting for people to engage with your scientific products. And then here you can see this will be reorganized, but the, the competing interests, the funding sources, and then the peer review information. So now you can skip, you are know, like, ah, oh, who reviewed this paper? You skip directly down. If the information is available, you can see the editor and the reviewers. And then, as we mentioned, the open peer review revolution. Uh, where you could link to the actual content and then boom, you have all the peer review comments, all the editor's comments for all round of revisions because it often goes multiple rounds. Um, and, and how the authors responded to the problems that were identified. Because as we already mentioned, um, although there's a lot of boring stuff in these peer reviews, uh, often there are nitty gritty details that never surfaced or never got transferred to the actual official P 
PDF. Oh, and I should mention, you, you'll also link to HTML versions of the article and preprints if they're available. Because often HTML, as we'll see, is, is better than PDF, especially if you're consuming it on a large screen. And so, yeah, this is not just for accountability of journals, but it's for maximizing research efficiency because you can build from details and gain even more insights into the backstories of a paper and how it started and uh, a lot more details. Sometimes, as I said, the peer reviews are longer than the paper itself. And then you can link to videos related to the paper, maybe video presentations of someone, one of the co-authors discussing or presenting the paper, presentation slides, links to supplementary materials, which again, you, you got to keep track of and people are emailing you about your papers and you got to find stuff fast. Uh, and so this is selfishly beneficial, but also uh, maximize ex accessibility for everyone other researchers and the citizens or government analysts or NGOs, and then even news coverage. So you can add links to news coverage or uh, other new media coverage of your article. And, you know, this is, it's not about encouraging narcissism. It's just that if your article is being covered, it's something to be proud of. Um, assuming you didn't bribe any journalists. <laughs> and then even Wikipedia, we'll see example uh, of if your paper's mentioned and, and referenced in Wikipedia, that's something that is being tracked now, I think by Altmetric. And so that can all be organized for all of your articles. And then you can organize this into your own author page and so we'll demonstrate this and if you're logged in you would just go uh yeah we didn't really demonstrate the search well this is a search results page um and but it has a delicious um autocomplete where you can quickly go to the paper or if you want to find another author's page um like wolf you could easily go to their author page but if you're logged in you can also just click on your own avatar and then it brings you to your own author page but this is a public page so anyone with a link to this page will be able to access all the content without logging in like public public we're talking fully public public domain no no complications and it's minimalist uh, and it would look it will look even prettier with these uh, cleaned up here which of course uh, these would not appear if you're uh, logged out because only uh, the authors can modify their own author page and so it's just an article list of your own articles and this will be customizable, very customizable in terms of do you want, because uh, now you can search within the list to quickly find one of their papers, uh, like the reproducibility project uh, or the simulation paper. I want to access the code um, or quickly find a figure. Oh, here's an example of an animated image that is becoming uh, more common, which we're really excited about. So again, these are boring black and white static graphs, charts, um, but it's still very delicious. I can just go through them without going through the PDF. But this would be an example of an animated. Uh, so this shows you how the relationship between two variables changes depending on the range of the x-axis variable. So I guess depicting some kind of non-linear relation. 
but this is a demo. I mean, it's, this is our testing server, so it's actually not part of the uh, official PDF. And and so all the information deliciously organized links direct links to PDF HTML preprints if they're available oh and then the impact metrics so I we mentioned it previously but here you can well some of these are are retrieved automatically but the state of the standards and the tech standards ontology are still insufficiently developed that these cannot yet be pulled in automatically but they will be soon but, but the idea right now is that you would update them maybe once a year as you're updating your CV I mean it's not like and um, and so it tells you oh well, you can't see this on the screen but if you hover over the numbers so this is the PDF's been viewed 342 times uh, as of a certain date it's been cited seven times uh, though that's in a year so yeah citations are always interpreted relative to time right because if this paper is 10 years old seven citation means a lot lower impact than if it's seven citations in one year and and then even impact metrics for the preprint and this will be both downloads and views and these will be you know the journals and, and other new platforms uh, they will not just have better impact metrics but allow them to be retrieved programmatically through an API so that when you build apps you can integrate all this information um, and again it's not a vanity contest it's just important for your own even personal psychological uh, needs or purposes it's a, it's a good barometer to consider how much impact in terms of number of views, downloads, and citation your papers are getting. And then you can start seeing, hmm, people seem to be interested in these types of articles and these functions. Maybe you're, you're developing statistical techniques, improving statistical techniques, or whatever your area is. It, it does tell you something, though it's, they're not perfect metrics but uh, again we don't want to throw away the baby with the bathwater and uh, so this is the future of not just organized articles but organized publication lists uh, and again these uh, are embeddable and and then sortable you could decide if you want to allow people to sort or filter by transparency or by article type or about uh, based on other metadata and customizable in many other ways uh, for different career stages so for example we mentioned working paper so for more junior researchers that have fewer papers, you often want to showcase your working papers at the top of your publication list. Whereas for a more established researcher, you would put the working papers at the bottom uh, or not at all. But even then, I think it's good to show that these are not, because you're showing the person, these are my publications, but this these are my current projects, which I'm working on. And so often, uh, when I visit people's websites, that, that's often, I look at their, I try to figure out their, what they're known for, their most impactful work, but then also their more, most recent work. Um, and all kinds of um, different customizations. Um, so some, like to number though that gets into the quantity obsession but some people it's still an achievement okay i've got 26 articles and and they number them 
um, and some want year headers that'll separate by year because it's you can see okay how many publications per year right so you could see 2019 2018 17 and so on um but 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 now one of the most exciting things more recently that is, is happening as part of this author page where we're attempting to develop the most deliciously user-friendly author page and the best way to consume scientific content or the most delicious way to consume scientific content uh, is what we're calling full screen mode. Now I have to zoom out a bit here. Uh, and so if your screen is large enough, and this is being optimized, this is still a very early beta, we should reiterate. But if your screen size is large enough and your links to your full text links support embeddedness, then you see this full screen icon so that when you're uh, interacting with an article card, you can click this full screen PDF and then it shows you in the full text PDF directly in the a right panel. And this is a bit slow. Our internet's been acting up. Plus this is coming from the journal's website, which is Meta Psychology. Um, and so this is the future where I'm trying to browse through your publication list and I want to just quickly see your papers. I don't want to be going chasing after links uh, outside of your author page and then having to close it and come back and figure out where I was. Uh, it's right there. Boom. You want to see the PDF? PDF's right there. And then you consume it. And then you move on. Whoops. That's a small bug. Or if you click on it, again, it closes. Right? And so imagine if all researchers had their PDFs and their article metadata um, because again, you can also, you can just jump right into the figure list. You just want to say, okay, what does it look like? Is it a real journal? Is it peer reviewed? Where's the peer review information? And I want to consume and interact with and jump in, dive in to the details. Um, everything is there. But it gets better because again, this is static content. PDF is meant for printing. And if it's the best you got, then okay, that's fine. Uh, but in the future, um, it'll be HTML content that can be, of course, embedded, but not just embedded, but interactive. Um, and so some journals now, though they're rare, but this is Frontiers in Psychology, and they have other problems, but at least they uh, allow their HTML version of articles to be embedded, right? So again, this, this is our commentary. And if I click on the HTML version, I get to read it right in the right panel. And then, you know, they're their HTML article uh, content templates are not very good, but uh, it's still, you know, it shows you, okay, it's edited here, right? Uh, and But again, this is why all the main metadata fields are organized in a standardized way. Because the different journals present the information in different ways, and it's hard to find. Um, though they are working on standardizing uh, some of these fields and um, 
and then everyone wins because they can advertise whatever they want. They can put their logo, right? And so we're essentially driving traffic to their journal website, but also just this counts as a view. Whether I view it external to the website or not, it's still a view. So you should uh, make it as easy as possible, not just for citizens to find your work, uh, but any other platform. There's all these popular science platforms and people blogging about scientific articles. So you want to make it easy for them to be able to embed your content so that the maximum number of people can interact with it and access it and reuse it and share it, remix it, it goes on. Um, but it gets, oh yeah, and these are the animated. <laughs> uh, animated images that shows you statistical paradoxes, which we're not going to get into, but it gets better. So we'll see another example of an HTML article. This is using manubot.org. They're pretty doing impressive stuff. Uh, and so this is an HTML version of an article about Sci-Hub, just in incidentally. And, and here they do have interactive pop-ups for citations. So when you are citing a paper, you can go directly to the paper. And our vision is that they can, our, we, we're going to have an article card version that can be used and embedded in pop-up citations within text. So in text pop-up citations, right? Because uh, then it would be even more delicious. And you could even see whether the paper meets a minimum transparency standard directly from a citation pop-up, right? Um, and then they have figures. These are not interactive, but I think you can, oh yeah, you can, uh, it's not swipeable. But still, right, much better than just a non-interactive HTML. This is an interactive HTML to some extent. Um, and again, pop-ups for citations. So you don't have to go all the way down. And even if you are in the reference section, uh, I think you can easily go to where it's been cited. Yeah. And um, so then there'll be a demand, an increased demand for uh, kind of converting your papers into interactive, delicious versions like this. And so, um, I mean, there are other websites like Overleaf um, that are helping you create uh, art, like more advanced uh, HTML articles moving forward, right? But if you want retroactively, maybe only for your best papers, but you could, we could offer a service to deliciousify uh, some of your older papers. So converting um, basically these ugly static PDFs into uh, beautiful HTML versions. So here's another example that's interactive HTML. This looks similar, but I think it's just our markdown. Um, but again, this is very technical. We want this even so that non-technical people can create interactive versions of their article. So this is an explorable multiverse, multiverse being one of the techniques to estimate robustness, which again is ensuring a result is robust to alternative statistical analyses, which are equally justifiable. And so this paper, if you click on it and use the letter A, you can actually go through the different ways to analyze the data and then see that the interaction pattern, which was between relationship status and fertility, predicting religiosity, it, it, it doesn't come out, um, right? So, so this is the original interaction. But you can see, vividly interact with the data and see that 
the the sexy finding uh, does not generalize, is not robust to other ways of analyzing the data, which are equally justifiable. And um, I don't remember what the, it uh, doesn't really matter. The interaction, oh, is that when you're ovulating, your no anyways you're more religious when you're ovulating than not ovulating but only if you're in a relationship anyways it was some uh sexy thing and so that's interactive and then if that's not impressive enough <laughs> um I'll show you a final interactive article of the future. That's what some people are calling them. Well, even the manubot.org. And there's another one I just learned about last week, which I can't remember the name because it's a bad name. Um, right? We have to think how should scientific articles be packaged digitally if we're really thinking about kind of the best way to and the the best way the most delicious user experience possible not just to make it more pleasant for everyone but so that it's more inviting uh and more accessible oh and we forgot to mention also this will be more accessible for the hearing impaired, visual impaired. Uh, you could have audio ebook versions of articles where you or a voice actor is paid to read a portion of the uh, article or a summary or even a lay version. There's now a move towards you have a, the abstract, the original abstract, but then you have a simplified English abstract for a less technical or non-scientific audience. So those could be voiced and recorded so that you can listen to someone reading the article on your smartphone as you're commuting, for example. I mean, the sky's the limit. Um, but the one thing is clear is that static PDFs and static non-interactive content it should be a thing of the past in terms of scholarly content and so here is just a, a demo that i created um which shows you the pop-up idea again that i mentioned so when you're citing a study you'll have interactive pop-ups as we saw with manubot but in this case it's the actual curate science article card so it might be a bit small but you can see it's title authors journal name, and then transparency. So you can quickly check that the papers being cited are credible and whether there's applications maybe uh, or critical commentaries, because that's often the case. You're citing old papers, but then you think, yeah, but has, has follow-up work maybe revised some of those findings or some of the theoretical work that's been done? Because that's another problem I don't think we really mentioned is the cherry picking of citations where you can you can selectively cite the studies supporting your story, your account, and then not mention work that contradicts your theory or your new angle. And to us, that's, that's borderline soft misconduct. Um, but it's harder to track down because you can always plead ignorance. Like, well, I didn't know about that research. And it's like, well, okay. But it's, again, it's your job to um, be an expert in your field and know what other people are doing. But, of course, you can't know everything. So, um, But, again, if this is all embedded in an integrated system, you can be reading a paper that cites another paper which you know has been refuted or at least corrected 
And if that's not linked, then you can add it directly in this context. I mean, you'd have to log in, but assuming you already have an account, and if you don't, you'll be able to easily create an account and add the information directly in the context of the very specific context of uh, being in a, a reference citation pop up, right? But more excitingly is that you would embed interactive charts directly into your article. Uh, and this is using Plotly, which is one of the better services right now. So it's not just interactive. Uh, you can zoom in. So this is showing you the average song length across periods of time, like the 60s. People got less patient, I guess. And the song lengths got shorter and shorter. And then they somehow got longer in the 80s and kind of peaked in the 90s. <laughs> Right? So imagine your scientific article looking like that instead of this. And again, this is my own article, so I can I can insult them as much as I want. Um, and then and then it gets better. Um, so these that was an interactive graph. And, but then you can go further and have these even more delicious 3D interactive graphs, right? And again, this is touch enabled, right? So I'm literally interacting with this 3D interactive chart with my touch screen. And this is embedded within my Curious Science author page, which means anyone could achieve this with their own author page with their free forever author page from curate science you can achieve not just the best organized article cards but the most deliciously user-friendly publication lists that are uh, embeddable easily disseminatable uh, and maximally accessible to the largest number of people who might be stumbling upon your work and of course all indexed properly so that Google Scholar and even just Google can find it. Um, so that's the demo or the main part. Um, and oh, and then well, this is embedded. You're still within Curate Science. And um, but Again, most people already have their own website. So this is my own website. It's in the Um If the internet can uh, cooperate. And so we're not forcing them, anyone to have to come to our platform because if you already have your own fancy website, then you can just embed. Uh, so you'll be able to embed your publication list. Uh, directly into uh, your own uh, website, no matter what the structure of your website is, as long as there's room for publication list. Um, and so I can show you that. So this is what was kind of the inspiration or the basis for the CS Curate Science author page. Um, but this is an example of pulling in the actual article list page from Curious Science. And so, oh, I didn't even show you how to edit. Nah. Oh, I could mention it, yeah, with the shortcuts. So yeah, so this is, Again, we're outside of Curate Science now. We're at itsendabella.com, some other directory, where I created this uh, different version of my website. And then to actually show you, I don't know if you saw it, let's reload the page and you'll be able to see over here. Oh, why is the internet so slow? You should be able to see it's loading. It's pulling the articles 
from Curate Science through its API and then displaying them in the same delicious article card, article list, where you can uh, look at all the metadata, jump into the delicious figures, and then even search. So I could search from within the list and then, okay, boom, there's what I was looking for. And then jump in. No, there's a bug there. Um, right. And you can do this externally uh, from, oh, here's the, the other bug. Uh, and embed this anywhere. And again, anyone can embed this, including a journalist or other people that are extending your work. Um, and everything is geared towards efficiency. So we'll go back here. I needed to show one last thing. Um, is that we adopt the standard keyboard shortcuts that the top industry level standards like Google products, YouTube, uh, well, Twitter less so. But a common, a lot of people don't know this, but if you want to go to the search box, you hit the forward slash and then it goes to the search box. So then you can go directly to what you're looking at or look or looking for rather. And so um, if I'm browsing over here and then, oh yeah, I want to go to that author's page. Okay, let me go type in Campbell. Oh, I misspelled it. And then boom, now you're at Lauren Campbell's page, right? And now you're okay. Uh, and then even, oh, I want to filter. So shift forward slash will go to the article list search uh, to quickly find a paper. But if you uh, need to go back to the main search box, again, forward slash, and I want to look for bias, and then away you go. Um, and tons of other examples. Uh, so on your own author page, there's control S to save. So if you want to change something, you click edit, uh, and then you want to change something and then control S and then boom, you're out of there. It's, it's updated. Oh, and then we even delicious drag and drop. If you want to drag, uh, images, right. You can drag them and drop them easily. Uh, control S just basic sh keyboard shortcuts. you you know, you have important things to do. You want to get going. Uh, you have to think about all of these little things in terms of efficiency, user friendliness, accessibility, uh, for everyone to make it maximally accessible, inclusive, I guess you could say. Um, and, and again, this is part of an integrated system. So it's not just trying to organize yourself, organize your publication list in the best way possible, but you're doing this in the context of an integrated system to ensure uh, transparency and credibility. And so there'll be more incentive to come use this system, create your own author page, because it's part of a broader integrated system. And so uh, eventually, if you need to indicate that you've met a certain transparency standard, you can do it once and then it's done for all stakeholders. So for example, you do it for the journal, as we showed, um, you can go back here. Um, and so you do it for the journal. Where is it here? You do it for the journal once and then it's part of the system. It syncs up to the system. So then your university librarian uh, gets notified that you have a publication and that you're meeting the, the standard. The funder gets notified automatically. Oh, this grantee now has a publication, a new publication, and it meets our standard. Everything's clear. Okay, we're good. It's an integrated system to make it as easy, as simple, and least bureaucratic as possible to ensure transparency and credibility. And then through transparency, you achieve accountability for everyone. Um, and 
And so, yeah, we have lots of people to contact. Um, and so you'll be hearing from us. We're already in the process of reaching out. Um, there's already journals interested in using the system, uh, universities. Uh, there's some promising possibilities, especially in the Ger German system, Netherlands, UK, uh, where the governments put a lot of pressure for universities to raise their standards. And then the funders. Um, and then the, the rapidly growing number of grassroots open science movement uh, initiatives, rather, there's uh, even a few months ago over 220 open science initiatives around the world, rapidly spreading globally, uh, of interested researchers that want to do better research. Um, and, and so there are literally hundreds of groups and initiatives that could benefit from using our transparency and credibility curation tools and broader integrated system. And so that more or less wraps up the demo. I'm sure I forgot some things, but um, that gives you, should give, have given you a rough sense of what we're envisioning. And again, what you can already do, the um, early beta is still closed because it's still needs to be polished a little bit more before a public launch, but we are close and getting closer all the time. We have basically about 35 beta testers who are actual researchers at the leading edge at the forefront of the transparency movement in the social sciences and other replication mavericks. And um, yeah, and we do have a large database of replications. We didn't even really show that. Mm. Um, so, okay, real quick. If you click on browse, you can, so by default, it's filtered by only articles that have public study materials, data, and code. But you can clear that, because again, we're trying to showcase the future, showcase leading scholars who are courageous and being more transparent. Um, but you can clear the filters and then get a more exhaustive list. But then you can filter by article type. So you could say, only show me replications that were pre-registered and have open data, right? Because maybe you, you, you want uh, more confirmatory replications. I mean, replications are already a lot more confirmatory than an original paper because you're constrained by the previous study. You have to make sure your methodology is similar enough to a previous study or else it doesn't even count as a replication, it would be more of a generalizability study. And we, we did touch upon why there needs to be a fuzzy, at least a fuzzy boundary between a replication study and a generalizability study. Because if you only do generalizability studies, uh, you can never cast doubt upon a previous study because you've changed so much in the experiment that if you get negative results, you can explain away the negative results by the change in methodology. <laughs> and in grad school, we were brainwashed that conceptual st replications, the so-called, uh, they were called replication studies, but they should have been called generalizability studies. And we were brainwashed that generalizability studies are always better than replications because you're seeing if your findings generalize to other contexts, other pictures or other manipulations, other measures, right? But again, if you're always changing something, then there's too many moving parts. And then you, you can cling on to a bad idea like social priming for way too long. Um, 
And this is why the new research culture is a culture of replication. So you don't just accept findings because they're peer reviewed or published in a prestigious journal. You believe in something uh, because of the replication evidence. And so um, we would also have what we showed uh, is replication collections, um, which would then beautifully organize all replications related to a topic and then the different replications of the different effects using different methodologies and then you could easily get up to speed as to okay what effects are do seem replicable and which ones are still having replication difficulties and then how can we productively focus our energy in further investigating generalizability validity and uh, maybe mechanisms. So in this case, you have potentially uh, longhand note-taking might be more effective at learning than laptop note-taking. But then you have to ask yourself why and maybe for whom this benefit applies. Because coming from at it from... Uh, a more within person, well, which is good, this is within subjects, but it's still averaging across individuals. Um, yeah, we don't want to get into the technicals too much, but is you'd want to start figuring out what differentiates individuals for whom longhand is better than laptop versus individuals maybe where there's no difference or the other way around. For, for some individuals, it is possible that laptop would be more effective than note-taking, especially if you have a physical disability or you have other, maybe a different way your brain consolidates information and memory and recall and attention, right? So there's all this heterogeneity across students in learning mechanisms need to be accounted for. Uh, and, and so again, replicability is just a beginning. It's not like we're saying, uh, you come here and then, okay, you discover absolute truths. But if you want to productively investigate phenomena, you need to ensure at least minimally that studies are minimally transparent, meet a minimum transparency standard and replicate at least, uh, to some extent. And of course, for public policy, uh, you also want to um, ensure that findings uh, maybe go even further, that they're transparent, replicable, and generalizable. You might want to see a, a higher standard of generalizability before you, you actually implement it in schools, right? And um, so that's the the broader vision um, and we're uh, working as hard as we can but as we mentioned we're now in a funding campaign so if you're inspired by any of this and are interested in really helping to make uh, a dent in improving transparency and replication standards forever then please reach out uh, we need your help whether you're interested in being a financial partner, a parent organization, or other collaborations. We're also seeking code contributions from programmers who are passionate about improving science and, uh, and all kinds of other exciting opportunities. Um, and uh, so just to... And on a broader note, uh, again, we're aiming for a simple, user-friendly, integrated system that's as efficient as possible, as simple to use as possible, and the least bureaucratic, because we hate bureaucracy more than anyone. And so it, you're thinking minimum transparency standards and maybe an oath uh, for scientists inspired by the Hippocratic Oath that medical doctors take 
where you pledge to do no harm and to have the highest professional integrity, we could have something similar. It's already been proposed. Um, where you pledge to meet minimum transparency standards and you pledge to do no harm and to exhibit the absolute highest level of honesty and integrity. And um, that's it. That's all we really need to um, bring us pretty far in terms of raising standards relative to the cost. And, and all the benefits that come with raising standards just by a little bit. Um, and uh, I mean, there's other changes that would be required as we discuss for specific stakeholders like uh, journals and universities would need maybe enhanced fraud procedures, but that's more of a government issue though we should develop harmonize integrity standards that any publicly funded university could use so that they don't have to reinvent the wheel all the time. Um, it's just, okay, here's a standard integrity requirements if you want to be an accountable university. These are the requirements. Um, and here are templates that you can just deploy. And, and so again, just to reiterate um, my bold recommendation, which I alluded to is um, and it shouldn't be bold. If you just connect the dots of what we just reviewed and, and the high stakes and the hyper competitiveness and all of the ways the current academic system is broken. Um, if you connect the dots, there's, there's really no other option than to say all public funding needs to be pulled immediately unless universities agree to institute a minimum transparency standard. And so there was two, be two facets, facets there. Um, researchers would have to meet a minimum transparency standard in all their publications by a certain amount of time, like six months, 12 months. We recommend the Curate Science Starter Standard, but uh, anything really would be better than the status quo, the current system. And then universities um, also funding, universities funding should get pulled if they don't ensure that all researchers meet the minimum transparency standard. Because again, uh, the public funds scientific research in, in two main ways. One is directly through grants, which are given to individual researchers but universities also get funding directly from the government just for operating as a university, right? Um, and so funding in these two main channels need to be pulled unless the universities and the researchers agree to meet a minimum transparency standard. Uh, and that's for basic accountability, but it's also for the dozens and dozens of benefits we've reviewed in terms of making the research maximally accessible to as many people as possible, both for medical doctors, citizen scientists, other researchers in developing countries, uh, any kind of inventor, government analysts. Uh, science affects everyone's lives. And um, if it's publicly funded, it needs to be in the public domain. And that's it. And so, of course, um, we're built, we built an integrated system that can be used for all stakeholders, um, but uh, there might be other systems that come around and that's fine uh, as long as this happens. Um, I don't care who gets it done, it just needs to get done. And so just to finish off, uh, as should be clear, academic science needs, uh, wait, back up uh as should be mentioned rather academic system has improved in the past 10 years and there's lots to be proud of but it's not really close enough it's not as much as we need again given the high stakes the hyper competitiveness and 
And so we should be proud of the achievements we've made in making uh, academic research more transparent, slightly more transparent, um, but it's still not enough in terms of the basic requirements of science, which is transparency and replication. And so we owe it to ourselves, to other researchers, the broader scientific community, uh, the taxpaying public we serve, and most importantly, we owe it to the families of millions of people who are dying and suffering unnecessarily due to uh, treatments that have stagnated because of bad academic research, including many of my own family members who continue to struggle with depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, and other serious conditions like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, diabetes. Um, and, and so, as should be clear, academic science needs to be saved, can be saved, and will be saved, uh, because if all we need to do is apply our hearts and minds, and maybe wallets, to the problem, uh, and if there's a will, there's a way, and I know I will continue fighting this cause for the rest of my life if I need to. And so spread the word, leave critical comments and feedback in the comment section. And thanks for watching. It's important that you, the taxpayer, engage with the videos to increase their visibility. So please like or dislike videos, leave a comment regarding points of clarification or other issues or topics you'd like us to cover. Leave comments pointing out any inaccuracies, mischaracterizations, errors. Finally, please consider making a donation so we can continue to create videos and achieve our goals of reforming research standards in academia. You can make a donation on our Patreon page, link to my left, or by making a one-time PayPal donation, link in the video description. Thank you.